Chrysler, 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 yes. You've done it again, should I say still. Look, if you've ever been to the service department and needed the defibrillator after being handed the quote to repair your fine automobile, here is exactly what you do. John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the card that's up there now, dude. I am making a sincere effort to be more accessible to you, meaning more accessible to your questions unsolicited by email. I get a tsunami of these things. I spend a couple of days a week responding to them by email, and I thought the ones that really have serious audience cut through, okay, let's do them like this in the live stream part of the studio, but let's just go unscripted down the barrel Here's your friggin' answer. Here in the fat cave. Let's not be too grandiose about it. It's a it's a garage with tools in the background, but hey, it's still more credible than network TV news and current affairs, I'd suggest. Anyway, this particular email is from a dude named Pete who says, put my car in for a service check earlier this week. A service check because it's been a year and it needs to be done. Not so much for the mileage. They diagnosed a noisy water pump. The car is a five-year-old Chrysler 300 with 40,000 kilometres. <laughs> There's your first mistake, Pete. It's a Chrysler. Which I'd have to say, although you are a comparatively low kilometre driver, so five years and 40,000 kilometres, that's only 8,000 k's a year, which is like 160 a week, which is an average of like 20-something a day. That's nothing. Anyway, it's a baby, but still something of an endurance record, I'd suggest, for a Chrysler. So there's that. Pete says the quote came back at just over 2000 bucks installed. <laughs> yes. I'm not surprised. Frankly, this is not the first such email I've received, but it does fly in the face of this rhetoric from them at Fiat Chrysler Australia, doesn't it? This bullshit rhetoric about they've fixed the parts prices now. That's sort of no longer an issue. We've addressed that. Oops-a-daisy. Pete goes on and says, It seems a generous amount. Well, that's diplomatic, isn't it? For what is a relatively simple pump. And I go, yeah, dude, that's completely true. In reality, he says, it will just be a worn bearing. Uh Uh-huh. But of course you can't replace that. You need to replace the whole assembly. I guess this is supposed to justify the price because a couple of bearings would be a bit of a stretch at 2000 bucks. Yes, it would, even for them, dude. But hey, anything's possible in the future. Pete says, anyway, I will get the work done, but here's the grind. If I work with approximations, then four hours of labour should be enough to do the work, like half a day. Uh-huh. At 150 bucks an hour, there goes 600 bucks, and I can work with that. But that means the water pump must be approximately 1400 bucks. And Mr. Diplomacy, hashtag respect, he says, this is a sticking point. <laughs> yeah, dude, it would be for me too. Totally agreed on that. So let's say a car is like, I don't know, 5,000 parts. It's 5,000 to 10,000 parts. It kind of depends how you define part, okay? But... That's like $7 million to build a Chrysler 300 from spare parts. If you assume that a water pump is a kind of average replacement part, therefore it's one five thousandth of the price, 1400 bucks times 5000 $7 million. And then what have you got? A Chrysler 300. Yay. That sounds about right to me. So, And, of course, by right, I mean wrong. Anyway... <coughs> Pete goes on and says, I went to the manufacturer spare parts site in the United States, like America, where that part is available, and it even has a special discount price applicable right now, 210 bucks plus shipping, reduced from 237. That's American dollars, right? The pump is complete, including gasket kit bolt studs ready to install. And I'd say that's friggin' typical. Like, when are these dipshits in local car import operations? And I don't mean all of them, but I mean a selected cadre of the total. When are they going to realise that we have this miraculous new thing now? It's called the internet. 
and it allows you to do research on things such as this across international borders. And that does kind of constitute a disincentive, doesn't it, to purchase that kind of product again. It certainly would with me. Or to become a customer when an issue such as this gets oxygenated by an evil bastard such as, I don't know, that up himself guy who commentates on cars. Um, not Paul Merrick. Um, He's the one with the rubber tip. Anyway, there's another guy who sort of tells the truth about cars in his garage. Pete says, I understand companies cannot be benevolent societies, and I'm totally on board with this. They cannot. They have to sell their spare parts at a profit, but just not at a grossly extortionate one. Uh, He says, but it is really a big margin at the full list price to get from 210 US dollars, which is about 280 Australian, to 1,400 Australian micro pesos, isn't it? Looks like about 400% margin to me, Pete says, although shipping and holding the shelf stock needs to be accounted for. Yeah, I think a fair margin for getting that crap all the way to Australia and holding it in stock would be absolutely reasonable. It's a cost of doing business, but doesn't seem to uh, account for the extreme inflation in the price, does it? At least not to me, not as I understand these kinds of logistic operations. Anyway, uh, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, Pete says. More surprising is the fact that the water pump failed at 40,000 kilometres, which is about 24,000 miles. America and other markets in Imperialsville. And you can't just replace the bearings. It's the way of the world, the accountant's rule, he says. I'd suggest there's another point on this, right? And that is that all car companies are very keen to display their green credentials, like uh, Toyota's going to make a hybrid Land Cruiser, which is like the ultimate dichotomy, isn't it? Why build a big fat thing like that if you want to be green? Anyway, one of the least green aspects of car maker operations is the fact that you can't just replace the bearings. And I'd suggest it is a manifestly ungreen even brown, thing to do to just throw away an entirely serviceable water pump that needs a couple of bearings pressed into it. That's just environmentally reprehensible, and it's also not the best deal for consumers, is it? And that's because these kinds of operations, spare parts operations, are overseen by some evil bastard bean counter, and he doesn't care about the planet, and he doesn't care about your bottom line. He just cares about efficiency and pumping up the profit in the spare parts domain and that's why you get that kind of situation because let's face it if you made a water pump serviceable you'd have to sell the bearings separately and you'd have to sell the impeller separately and you have to have a housing and then you have to have all of that other stuff the kit that comes with it all right so instead of just having one thing on the shelf in your warehouse water pump assembly job done very efficient from a accounting logistic point of view you'd have three wouldn't you you'd have the housing with the gasket and the bolts and all of that crap and then you'd have the bearings one packet with two bearings in it presumably maybe one bearing if it's a plain bearing of sufficient length to you know support the sharp anyway shaft I should have said. And uh, then you'd have to have the impeller. So you've got three packets instead of one. You'd need three times as much shelving. And if you did that across the 5,000 parts, it'd be 15,000 parts, wouldn't it? So more complex from that point of view, but a much better deal for the planet. And ultimately on the unit price, a much better deal for you. So there's that. Pete goes on and says, issues like this will surely become a future sticking point for service departments when EVs eventually become a viable alternative. Managing that transition will be a truly exciting experience for support managers. Issues like these will surely hasten that transition. Well, I don't actually agree with that, Pete, but let's get into it and make this relevant to you. Because not everyone, thankfully, owns a Chrysler 300 or a Fiat Chrysler product, but everyone at some time in their automotive life is going to come face to face with the repair bill that they can't jump over. Their car's going to be out of warranty. They weren't expecting it. It's a big hit and it's entirely unpalatable. And what you get from the service department is typically, well, that's the price. And the defibrillator is in the dunny's uh, second door on the right for you, sir. <laughs> like that. That's about the level of compassion that is typically forthcoming in these situations. Anyway, I'd suggest that the first thing you need to consider is the issue of warranty versus consumer law because they're grossly different things and the warranty runs out at a particular time and in some cases at a particular distance. 
all right? But consumer law keeps going forever since the 1st of January 2011 here in Australia. And you need to know what protections pertain because dealerships and some car makers prey on ignorance, consumer ignorance here. They can profiteer off the back of people who do not know how consumer law works. So there is this thing, and you can Google it. It's called the guarantee, the consumer guarantee of acceptable quality, all right? And part of that means that goods and services need to be reasonably durable. That's everything from a coat hanger to a car, all right? And different durability constraints pertain because of the nature of different products, right? But cars need to be reasonably durable. And if they're not, then the car maker is not able to sidestep his obligation to fix it free for you just because the warranty has expired. And I'd suggest a water pump in a purportedly premium product like a Chrysler 300, and I'm sure that everyone at Fiat Chrysler head office would say, oh, that's a premium vehicle, sir. Certainly on the showroom floor, that's what they're trained to say. A premium product like that all of those mechanical systems like water pumps and alternators and things like that, they should last longer than 40,000 kilometres or five years or whatever, right? They just should. That's reasonable in the minds of a reasonable consumer, the expectations of a reasonable consumer, which is exactly how the legislation is framed, okay? So if they give you this, here's the price, the warranty's expired, we can't offer you any support, what I strongly suggest you do is Google the term C consumer guarantees all right and do your research on that figure out how the law works and then you should write to them not have a conversation across the counter at them just walk out don't agree to get the work done especially if it's just a noisy water pump that can remain noisy for the next 20,000 k's or something just go home do the research and then google the term a triple c complaint letter there's a complaint letter template and even a complaint letter generation tool at the ACCC's website. Use it because it will be full of all of the consumer law buzzwords. And you can either print it and hand it to them or email it to them and demand a resolution, which would be a free repair in this case, which Pete would be entitled to, I'd suggest, even though he went out and just got the work done. Okay, Once they read that, a lot of that predatory stuff, it just evaporates, okay, because they know that you know the rules of the game. This is like running onto the field or getting into the boxing ring and either knowing the rules or not knowing the rules. Knowing the rules is pretty important when you're going to be in a battle such as this. So do that, whatever you do, right? Now, I'd suggest further that in 2020, Chrysler did... A Fiat Chrysler Australia did a review of all of the parts they sold in 2019, and they claim that was an inventory of some 17,000 parts. And they further claim that they did this diligently and that excessive prices were quote unquote realigned. Okay, now I'd suggest not just based on this, but based on the balance of emails that I receive in this vein, you know, there's a lot of disproportionately high number of complaints about the price of Fiat Chrysler parts. Okay, so I'd suggest that they either did that badly, that realignment and assessment, or they didn't do it at all, and it was just half-assed bullshit as a PR stunt, okay? I, it's kind of an Epicurean paradox, right? Only with spare parts, not God. So, what other option is there? I ask you, if you can think of one, let me know in the comments below, but I just can't think of one. I really can't. So this would be like one of those red flags about dealing with a dud brand, okay? Do you want to deal with a dud brand or a good brand? And I'd suggest that this is one of the principal differentiators between all of the different automotive brands in Australia. You take two direct competitors that are very similar in the experience of driving, okay? Take like a um, C63 AMG from Mercedes-Benz or a BMW M3 competition from BMW, right? Very similar cars, like awesome to drive and so much more dynamically capable than the average person who is ever going to own or drive them, right? So beyond expectations in virtually every respect, except customer care, because my experience of this, based on untold emails from different customers, is that 
Mercedes-Benz is far more likely to throw you under the bus if you have a legitimate problem. They're much more likely not to care, whereas BMW seems far more ethical, benevolent, whatever you want to call it. They just, here in Australia at least, they get on it when there's a problem and the customer has been let down. Okay, they just get on it. So this is a major differentiator between the different brands. It's very hard to do the research on this, however, because independent data is not available. And most journalists are motivated by bad incentives like advertising for the publisher. They want to compromise that revenue by telling the truth about how customers get treated. Heaven forbid. Right. It's very difficult to get that information. So there's that to consider. All right. If you're thinking about buying a car, think about the dud brands and eliminate them from your shortlist because you can sidestep a world of pain down the track if you just make the right choice about the brands. And for disambiguation, I recommend Toyota, Lexus, in no particular order, Hyundai, Kia, Subaru, BMW, brands like that. They have a long track record that I know of firsthand of looking after customers with legitimate complaints who have been unfortunately let down at some part of their experience, either by a service department at a particular dealer or just in terms of the reliability of their product. Okay, so there's that to consider. Now, If a dealer quote seems excessive, you know, you're just standing there and you were expecting, as Pete was, a conventional service, right? Just a normal service, dude, three, four, five hundred bucks, whatever it's going to be. And they say, oh, noisy water pump, two grand. (laughs) Right? If that happens, like deadpan them and say, that seems somewhat excessive for a water pump. You know, just see what they say. And then the response is kind of, you know that this interaction, like this is what you say, you say, you know this interaction and this kind of seeming profiteering, which is designed to exploit me because I need this new part, you know that's going to affect what car I buy next. You know it's going to affect my ongoing decision whether or not to have the car serviced here at your fine dealership. Are you sure you don't want to just go away and think about it? Just say it like that, okay? Because you're the customer, customer's always right, generally, except when they're wrong. You, you've got a fair bit of right on your side in this case, though, right? See what they say. And if they really do deadpan, you're like, mm, don't give a fuck, dude. Like, here's the price. If that's paraphrasing the response you get, then I'd suggest look at independent repairers, okay? Particularly in the case of these niche brands like Chrysler, go and have a look at an independent repairer who specializes in that brand, Because there will be a dude out there in your major metro area who cut his teeth on that brand in a Chrysler dealership and looked at how badly customers were getting treated and looked at how simple it was to get the part from overseas at much less price and pass some of those savings on to the customer and turn their frown upside down. I'd further suggest that independent mechanics have different motivations than dealership Uh, service departments, right? Because a dealership service department, their main job is to augment the profit of the business, okay? Service managers are incentivized to drive up their profit center, okay? So that the business is profitable. Whereas your independent mechanic is fundamentally in the business of saving you money, right? He doesn't get paid if he doesn't save you money, if he's not a better option, if it's not more convenient or more professionally done or he doesn't drag you into the... Like, he, an independent mechanic can drag you into the workshop and stick your head under the hoist if you are mechanically minded and say, see that? That's fundamentally the problem here and I'm going to try and do this and if that doesn't work, I'll have to do this and here's kind of the budget. And if you don't have the budget for that now, why don't you come back in three months because you know it'll probably last that long and you can have these conversations with independent mechanics that save you money right you can't do that at a dealership so the independent option is often half the price or less okay so you could do that as well and of course the only part of this conversation where I disagree with Pete is his supposition that EVs are going to solve the problem like this ripoff if you like is a product of internal combustion and not a product of the way car makers do business I'd suggest it's got nothing to do with the underlying product and everything to do with the philosophy of the way the car maker does business. So let's just do a hypothetical here, okay? If you're in your EV and you are driving from Sydney to Melbourne, you get halfway, you need a big, fat, fast charge, and you plug into a DC charger, your EV is going to accept 75 or maybe down the track 150 kilowatts of 
DC charge, okay? This is a massive amount of energy for a battery to drink up very quickly. And to do that, the cooling system on board in the EV needs to go off its tits and operate at its maximum capacity, particularly in the middle of summer, some 45 degree day or something, Celsius, then, you know, the car's really going to have to strive to keep the battery cool enough to maintain its longevity without sort of killing it quickly, all right? And when that happens, inevitably, the pump is going to fail prematurely in some situations. If the R&D was poor or if the bean counter decided to go with the 15 cent bearing for the coolant pump instead of the 20 cent bearing. Okay, And that really is how these decisions are often made. We can save five cents here and three cents there and two cents there. That's 10 cents across a million products. That's a hundred thousand dollar saving and so what if some customers are affected by the premature failure of the coolant pump they're already owners at this point we can make money from them this is a philosophical thing it's not an ev versus internal combustion thing at all there are plenty of components in evs like bearings in motors which are going to fail and the conversation is going to be oh we don't service the motors we just change them sir that'll be fifteen thousand dollars Right, And it doesn't matter if it's $2 worth of main shaft bearings or something, or $10 or $15. It's just going to be that kind of conversation. So I very much doubt that EVs are going to solve this problem. And that is A, environmentally disgraceful, and B, commercially disgraceful in the domain of keeping you on side as a customer for subsequent purchases. So when it comes to EVs, I'd suggest the Leopard is extremely unlikely to change its spots.